The fall of Babylon the Great. That's what we're going to be talking about in this chapter um, of Revelation, Revelation chapter 18. That's where we are in our study of the book of Revelation. We've talked about Revel, uh, we've talked about, uh, excuse me, um, Babylon the Great. Um, the last few weeks, um, as we've looked at chapter 17, um, the Babylon the Great, who's personified as a seductress, uh, a, a harlot, a prostitute. Um, and we've seen how her destruction comes about in the, in, when the ten horns and the beast turn against her and destroy her. And we see that her destruction is complete. Now the destruction of Babylon the Great is announced, it's proclaimed, and we see how other people who have engaged with her are affected by her fall. Um, and that makes up most of what we're going to see in chapter 18. We're going to take this week and next week uh, to look at this chapter, Revelation chapter 18. And in this episode, I want to point out something that I think is 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 pretty interesting. And it points out all the more uh, the graciousness and um, the and the and the and the mercy of our God, as well as the power and um, and uh, the authority that he holds as well. Um, and as we're going to see, as it relates to the destruction of Babylon the Great. So um, some good things that we're going to talk about coming up. So I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. All right, so we're starting uh, yet another chapter in chapter 18. What a journey it has been uh, so far in our in our in our study of the book of Revelation. Um, we have been in this book for a little over a year. I, I remember we started. Um, May, I think it was mid December of 2020, um, and now we are in we are in April, um, mid April, I guess you could say May, mid April of. Um, of 2022, um, and we're getting closer and closer to the end. We're we're inching our way um, to that area, and still a lot of magnificent and insightful things uh, coming up in our study of the Book of Revelation. Um, before we get started in our text today, um, I want to because uh, you because you, you know because you know you know what time it is, ladies and gentlemen. It is time for the shameless plug of my book, Signs of the End. What did Jesus say about his own? return and the events that point to it. I'm available on amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com. Again, it's a book uh, about uh, the Olivet Discourse, um, Matthew, thir- uh, excuse me, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Um, and so I, I would, again, I would, I would strongly encourage you uh, to pick up a copy of this book, especially if you've been following through on this study of the book of Revelation, um, because there's a lot of things covered in that that we don't cover in, in this study of the podcast and vice versa. So, um, but I, I really hope, I really think that it will be a helpful resource for you, um, in just, um, you know, not only just eschatologically overall, um, it does do that. That's not the main aim because the main aim is to interpret Jesus's words in the Olivet Discourse in a particular passage. So it, it gives you a little bit of an uh, overall eschatological insight, but specifically um, gives you uh, an insight on you know what Jesus was meaning and what you know in his words to his disciples on the Olivet Discourse. You know, and especially with talking about the uh, the temple. In Jerusalem, not one stone will be left on top of another. What what temple is he talking about? Is he talking about that first century uh, temple, or is he talking about a future tribulation temple, as a lot of people say? We talk about the we talk about that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I, I would really encourage you to pick up a copy again by Amazon.com, BarnesNoble.com. I will leave as usual. I will leave a link in the in the episode description so you can click on it it'll take you right to the amazon page um, and you can place an order uh, for a copy of my book there again the the title of the book is signs of the end what did jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it so um order it read it and be blessed okay um so let's get into this whole thing uh, with uh, revelation chapter 18 like i said um before uh, we we've we've looked we've talked about um babylon the great uh before 
Um, Babylon the Great, um, and not only in chapter 17, I mentioned how we talked about her in chapter 17, but Babylon the Great has, has been mentioned a couple other times um, in the book of Revelation. Um, even before that point, um, you know, you, you'll recognize her specifically in um, in places like uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 14 and also in Revelation chapter 16. Um, and then when we got to chapter 17, uh, you'll, you'll remember how she was, uh, uh, you know, we, we get this, we get this vision of this prostitute, this woman who's living in luxury. I mean, the description that's given about her is, is like, she is decked out and she's riding the beast. Um, and the description there is that she is, that she is, is dressed in all sorts of precious, uh, jewels and jewelry, um, and that sort of thing, clothed really luxuriously. Um, and, um, and, you know, the kings of the earth and everybody else who dwells the earth goes into her. They commit sexual immorality with her, which again, that's, that's seen more as a, you know, as, as a spiritual metaphor. Um, although sexual immorality in the literal sense could, very well be be seen as well in in certain pagan religions and things like that. But overall, we're talking about um, luxury, riches, um, economic security that it, that is designed to draw people away from the one true God, or to keep their minds off the one true God and one true God and that sort of thing. Um, and her, you know, her relationship with with the saints, well, it's not a good one um, because it says that she's drunk on the blood of the of the saints. Um, who testified to Jesus Christ? Um, so we know what her feelings are towards, uh, you know, towards the saints, the people of God, and obviously by extension, God Himself. Um, it's not a good one. However, there's, you know, there's this warning because there's still this allure, there's still this pull um, towards her because she looks so decked out, and 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 it looks. You know, her way looks so appealing. And again, what we're talking about here, you know, looking at the woman in a, in a symbolic form, um, you know, what we're look, talking about is the is the is the economic luxury, the security and that sort of thing. But the thing with her is that you can have this, but it's at the expense of you uh, of your of your dedication and your devotion to the one true God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Her system would say that you can't have both. Okay, and that's the draw, and that's the allure. Um, you know, well, the allure is how she looks, and essentially the message saying that you can be like this, but you can't have this and God at the same time. And the and the hope is that the lure is so is so strong um, that she's successful in in drawing people away. And of course, as it relates to actual unbelievers, she is successful with a whole bunch of them, and as well as the kings of the earth. But if you remember, you know, her connection to Babylon the Great, remember that on her forehead, according to chapter 17, verse 5, it says that uh, um, on her and, and on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and earth's abominations. So there we see that 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 her label is Babylon the Great and her allure is great because, again, as, as the descriptions have said, in the previous verses, the kings of the earth and the inhabitants of the earth and all those people are drawn to her. And even John, you remember, John himself is marveling at at the woman, is marveling at this prostitute. Um, and the angel says, Don't be why are you marveling? I'll show you, you know, everything going on with this with this with this prostitute. Um, and with the beast. Actually, he says, like, you know, the you know, in uh, in chapter 17, um, and uh, in verse uh, in verse seven, but the angel said to me, "Why do you marvel? I will cast you. I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her." And then he goes in. The angel goes in to describe the beast first, and we're understanding who the beast is, and we've uh, we've encountered the beast and everything like that. His wickedness. That's who the woman rides, right? So her associations are evil. And it's made plain and clear that the beast is one who's going to be going down for the count, uh, but not before the the woman does. And the woman goes down with the count by the hand of the beast and the ten horns, which we which we identified as being the kings of the earth at the end, at the end. Okay, um, there's a lot of things that we can say at, in in review, but that would take a long time. Just listen to the previous episodes leading up to this point. 
and you'll see the analysis there. But all this to say, um, you know, and again, finishing things off as we did last time in verses 15 through 18, the, the end of the prostitute, the end of the woman um, is, not a, is not a pretty one. And when you get into chapter 18, you have the end of the prostitute proclaimed. This is what's going to happen to her. Um, you get a little bit of an insight on the attitude of the woman, right? Um, and you're going to see in a good chunk of the chapter um, the 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 uh, the lamenting spirit of everybody else who engaged in the woman, who engaged with the prostitute in this whole vision. Okay, um, and again, they're they're going to look at this and they see that man, this this is not a pretty sight at all. Okay. Um, so let me do this because what we're what we're going to look look at our our uh, our concern for this episode is verses one through eight um, of chapter eighteen, and then after that next week I think we can pretty reasonably get through the rest of the chapter. Okay, but for right now we're looking at verses one through eight. Okay, in verses one through eight of chapter eighteen, this is what it says: It says, "After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven." having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt of, for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For, she, for, for her sins are heaped, are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities." Pay her back as she herself has been paid back, has, has paid back others and repay her double for her for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed as she as she glorified herself and lived in luxury. So so give her a like measure of torment and mourning since in her heart, she says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow and mourning. I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Okay, so wow, somewhat intense stuff that we're that we're seeing here. Um, so here we go with this uh, with this uh, whole thing of of this declaration of um, of Babylon uh, Babylon's fall. Okay, and um, it, the the when the chapter starts out, you know, some people have had questions about how this, how this starts out. And this isn't really a new thing, given the fact that we've seen um, angels appear in very glorious form uh, before in the book of Revelation. And we have the same thing here in chapter 18. And in verse one, where he says, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, uh, having a great, uh, having great authority and the earth was made bright with his, uh, was made bright with his glory. Now, some people might ask, is this depicting the return of Jesus Christ? I mean, after all, you have uh, an angel coming down from heaven, right? And, he's expla- and it's explained that, that he's coming with bright light um, and with glory and that sort of thing. I mean, you read that sort of language and you say, how, well, how can this be just an ordinary angel? Isn't this Jesus Christ himself? Well, again, uh, one one thing that we can say is that within the within the uh, the scope of this current vision that we're looking at right now we don't see the coming of Jesus Christ until chapter 19 okay which i i which i would fit into this into the scope of this of this uh of this vision that we're looking at right now um and we'll and we'll see the coming of Christ from heaven in chapter 19 not here in chapter 18 but another thing that we could that we could see um, here is that you know again I don't think that it's right to uh, attribute to an angel you know uh, the equivalency of Christ I mean that's just not that's just not a thing 
Um, not anywhere, and especially not here in the book of Revelation. But I think the one thing that you could say is that the angel reflects the glory of the one who has sent him, okay? And I think that that is reasonable. You know, you get an understanding of the heavenly source and the authority of, you know, thereof, you know, coming from heaven. So you get the sense that this message is a message from heaven, from God himself, as it's reflected in the glory that's shown through the angel and the mighty voice with which he speaks. Okay. And I think that that's the best way to look at this. But this is a, this angel is, is pretty much a messenger. The angel, the angel himself is not one who is destroying Babylon the Great. That, or, you know, that's not what we're looking at here. The angel is just speaking and saying, this is what's going on here. And so that's, that's really the way that we should, that we should look at this. But really, it is a magnificent scene here. You know, we're talking about an angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. Okay. And that's not an, an authority in and of himself, that's an authority that's bestowed upon him, I believe, from God himself as he comes down, and he's announcing with authority, I would say, the fall of Babylon the Great, okay? So he's having great authority, and the earth uh, and the earth was made bright with his glory. Now, verse 2, it says, and he called out with a mighty voice, and it says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Now, that's familiar language. Um, you know, especially, you know, particularly here in the book of Revelation, um, if you remember, it's been a little bit of a while, um, but back in chapter 14, we see the same thing, um, in chapter 14, verse eight, uh, where it says another angel, a second followed saying fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So there we saw this whole thing of fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. That, by the way, is not unique in the book of Revelation. That's, again, that's something that's drawn from the Old Testament. Specifically, you can see that in Isaiah 21, 9. Okay. And in Isaiah, that was, um, you know, that's, that's an actual reference to the historical Babylon and the judgment that's going to befall historical Babylon. Here in Revelation, we under you know, and again, we've talked about all this before. Babylon is 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 mostly associated as an enemy of God's people. I mean, just drawing from what you understand of Babylon in the old te- in the Old Testament, Babylon was seen as an enemy of God and an enemy of his um, of his people. And again, we see that as they went as they, as they went against the Israelites and that sort of thing. And that's how we understand it. So we're not talking about in in Revelation, we're not talking about a literal Babylon or a rebuilt Babylon, but that's supposed to conjure up in our minds an enemy of God and an enemy of God's people, okay? Which could be, you know, all sorts of nations all throughout the world, both in the first century and all throughout human history up to this point, Um, you know, enemies of God, you know, among the nations and that sort of thing. So that so and and specifically and again going to what we're seeing in chapter seventeen, um, something along the lines of um, economic uh, luxury um, and uh, economic security and and one who is luring people um, away from God or anything having to do with God, keeping them in isolated from anything having to do with God, and even trying to draw people of the church away from the one true God, right? And so that's so that's pretty much what we're dealing with here. So, um, and and just in just like in chapter in chapter fourteen, right? Um, that whole announcement of fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, um, is is an is an announcement that's made at the end. We saw a lot of judgment language um, of end time eschatological judgment language language in much of that section of chapter fourteen. Um, you know, we, we, and we, and again, we, we went into detail and we talked all about it. That's laid out there in that chapter. Here we have a judge, we have judgment language on Babylon, the great, that's going to happen at the end, um, as well. And so he says, fallen, fallen is Babylon, is Babylon, the great. She has now listen, uh, still in the middle of verse two, she has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. So pretty much, so what you have there pretty much, uh, it's interesting how this, how this looks here because you have, um, you know, for example, you, 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 
we're we're seeing right away the spiritual nature of everything underneath uh, underneath it all. Underneath everything that we're seeing here, we're seeing something deeply spiritual here from the evil spiritual realm, because it says she's become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit. So that gives us a clue. That gives us an understanding of what we're dealing with here. Um, but in addition to that, it's saying a haunt for a, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for uh, for every unclean detestable beast. Okay, a haunt, by the way, in case you don't know, meaning like it, 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 that's supposed to convey, you know, frequent dwelling in a certain in, in a certain place. Now, this sort of language um, is it, again is not foreign to scripture and is not something that's unique uh, to the Book of Revelation. You can go to places like Isaiah chapter thirteen. Um, you know, and read the ranges of, you know, verses 19 through 21. Um, and that is another place that's, that's in reference to Babylon, uh, and the destruction of Babylon back in Old Testament times. Um, again, you can see that in, in chapter 34, verses 8 through 14. I think that that section, um, has to do with Edom. Um, but the same language is, is used there. Actually, let me just read an example. Let me, let me, uh, go, let me read the two Isaiah, um, uh, references here. Isaiah chapter, th- let's see, chapter 13. And um, look, look, pay close attention to verses 19 through 19 through 21, where it says, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we know what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, so we know that we're dealing with something serious here, right? And and total. Um, when God overthrew them, it will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will, pen, will pitch his tent there. And, the, and again, by the way, again, this is talking about Babylon. Uh, no Arab will pitch, will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will, will make their flocks lie down there. But wild animals will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell, will will dwell, and their wild goats will dance. Hy- and you know, it, it goes into you know, even verse twenty-two. Hyenas will cry in their in its towers and jackals in the pleasant uh, palaces. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be it will not be prolonged. So, you you get a sense there. It is talking about total and utter destruction. Inhabit habitation of of any sort of human beings is going to be gone, and and what's going to take its place are the wild animals and wild beasts that'll be that'll be there. So you have similar language here and in Revelation chapter uh, what we see in Revelation chapter eighteen. Um, again, when you look at uh, Isaiah chapter um, what did I say? I said thirty four. Um, and again, this is, uh, specifically with Edom, uh, but with verses, uh, eight through, let's look at the verses eight through 14, which says for the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion and the streams of Edom uh, shall be turned into pitch and her soil into sulfur. Her land shall become burn, burning pitch night and day. It shall, uh, it shall not be quenched. It's smoke shall go up forever. Keep that in your mind, by the way, just, you know, uh, just as it relates to when we get to the later portion of our passage in, in chapter 14, uh, excuse me, chapter 18 of Revelation. Um, but um, from generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the hawk and the porcupine shall possess it. The owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch the line of confusion over it and the plumb line of emptiness. It's nobles. There is, there is no one there to call it a kingdom and all its princes shall be nothing. So you get a good idea here of how complete this destruction is going to be. Thorns shall grow over its, its strongholds, nettles and thistles in, it, in, its, in its fortresses. It shall be a haunt of jackals, an abode of ostriches. There you go with the animals and everything. Um, and then verse 14, and wild animals will meet, will meet with hyenas and wild goats will cry, will cry to his fellow. Indeed, there the night bird settles and finds her, finds for herself a resting place. So again, you get an idea of there's, 
no totally because of the destruction there's no habitation of any human beings great or small and it's taken over by you know wild beasts and wild animals they will be it will, it will be a haunt again you know to use the word there you know for these wild animals a, a quick note here because i read there at the very end of that passage there it says where the uh there the night bird settles from what i understand um the you know the the translation of that is is somewhat is somewhat iffy. There's a little bit of a mystery as to what that is, but some people have speculated um, that that is a translation of Lilith, which was uh, which was uh, said to be a mythological a demon creature. And in scripture, this is scripture's way of saying that this that it's going to be taken over um, by uh, you know by demons and de- and demonic beings. Which, if that's if that's the meaning that's being conveyed there, then you see the connection there with Revelation chapter eighteen, again, where it says that she that she has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit. Is that what that what that is saying there in that particular Old Testament passage? I'm not entirely sure, but I know that that's what what some scholars have have speculated um, as far as as far as looking at that. Um, but you see you see the connections there as far as the la- Old Testament language. You can also see that in Zephaniah two fourteen, Jeremiah fifty thirty nine, and uh, in Jeremiah fifty one thirty seven as it relates to all of that. And they, in those in those passages, you get this idea that there's judgment complete wiping out of a people and then a replacement of of animals and in you know wild beasts and that sort of thing but even here you know turning our attention back here to to revelation chapter 18 not only do you have you know where it says it's a you know become a dwelling place for demons and a haunt for every unclean spirit uh, but again you know it says a haunt for every unclean bird a haunt for every unclean detestable beast do you get an idea that this is not a clean place uh you know the 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 theme the repeated theme there in that verse is unclean 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 and especially when you when you tie that into birds and and beasts and things like that i mean your mind takes you back to the old testament where you had the division between clean animals and unclean animals there were some animals that were, that were deemed clean that that the people of israel could eat and then others that were unclean that they could not eat okay or that they could not touch or anything like that uh, if you touched a clean animal, you're okay. You touch an unclean animal. I think the best known of that is 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 our pigs or swine or something like that. Then they were deemed unclean, and they had to become ceremonially unclean, uh, uh, ceremonially clean, and that sort of thing. But you know, here's the thing that we would have to that we would have to think about. Okay, is that what you have is you know in the Old Testament time we were talking about clean and unclean animals. In the wild, in nature, in nature itself, there wasn't the division between clean and unclean. They all inhabited, you know, together. Okay, some so in in certain areas there were some animals crawling around that were clean, and others that were that were unclean. But even where there's unclean animals, you also had some clean animals as well around the area in in nature and that sort of thing. You know, and and Israel again had to discriminate between what God had had deemed as clean animals for them and the unclean, and make separation and not and avoid the unclean. But you know, with the clean, everything was okay. Here, as it relates to Babylon the Great, all you see is unclean. It's almost as if you're dealing with a habitation where there's no cleanness anywhere. All you see is un, are unclean birds and un, and detestable and detestable beasts. Okay. So the picture there is supposed to is supposed to conjure up in our mind something that is that is really bad because there's no cleanness in her, okay, and I think that that's the idea that we're supposed to get um, as it relates to all of this: a haunt for every and listen, every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean, unclean and detestable beast. Okay, now how did it get like this? What? How did it, how did it come to to this? As it relates to Babylon the Great. Well, that's where verse 3 comes in, where it says, For, okay, so, you know, it's telling us the reason here, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. That's the first part of verse 3 there. And we don't have to go into, into too much detail there. We've talked about that at length in previous passages. And again, I would say specifically in, in, uh, um, in, chapter, um, in chapter 17. 
Um, but again, I mean, uh, this is again something that you see um, in uh, in chapter fourteen, verse eight, which I read to you earlier. Again, where it says, "Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, who has made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality." So, what we're talking about here is, you know, be, you know, nations um, being drawn into the woman. Um, for, you know, for the, you know, being lured into luxurious living and, and, and that sort of thing, um, you know, without God, without any thought of God, with rejection of God, because that's the prostitute's whole game there. All right. And they're looking to get enrich themselves, um, in, in, in with her and that sort of thing. So we've talked about that before. And then the second part of verse three, it says, and the Kings of the earth, have committed uh, have committed immorality with her, and again, that's something that we saw at the beginning of chapter seventeen as well. So we're not encountering anything new there. Now, here's something that we haven't really come upon, but we're going to but we're going to talk a little bit more about in the second part of chapter eighteen next time, where it says, "And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living." Now, the fact that the merchants have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. They have grown rich. So they're seeing a lot of economic success. So we're going to see their reaction when, Bab- when you know, it, at this whole thing of the prostitute, Babylon the Great, having fallen and coming to a complete end. Because with the complete end of, Babel- of Babylon the Great, that thoroughly affects the merchants, not just them, but I mean, it does affect the merchants and they mourn and they lament over what has happened to her. Um, and that sort of thing, but you know, but there you see all of these, all of this idolatry um, that's going on with this woman, with the nations and the kings of the earth and the merchants and everybody and and and, and everybody like that. So the fall of Babylon the Great, as we're going to see later on in the chapter, has a profound negative effect on everybody who's gone into her. And has committed sexual immorality with her. I mean, they look at they look at her fall, and they're like, "This is kind of a big deal," um, and it and it and it's not good. This is not good at all. Okay, that's going to be their attitude. The merchants among among them, but and it's no wonder again because it says that 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 they've grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Okay. But now when we get into we get into verse four, notice what it says here. So we're introduced to another voice because it says, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, now catch this, catch this, uh, this first, uh, the latter part of this verse here, verse four, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Okay. Now the whole thing of come out of her, again, that's, that's, uh, um, that's language again. That's drawn from the old Tes- uh, from the Old Testament, specifically in Jeremiah chapter fifty one, verse forty five. Again, that's associated with the Babylon in Old Testament times, and saying to to God's people, "Come out of her." Um, be, and and again, the surrounding context is, is is in connection to the judgment that Babylon is going is going to suffer. Okay, um, same thing in Isaiah fifty two, um, verse eleven. And I think that is more, I mean, the context a little is a little bit more broad because I think it's talking about the nations in general, but at the same time, it's talking about the salvation of Israel, um, you know, I, I, and from salvation, I'm, I'm talking about from her captivity. And so I'm thinking that it, it still can be zeroed into Babylon, but it, it can, it can mean a lot more than Babylon in that passage. But again, you read similar language there where it's saying, come out of her, my people. And so. That's what it says here. Come out of her, my people. Now, the fact that it's saying my people could give people a, an understanding, perhaps, that what the angel is saying there and what the angel is announcing um, is that is tell, telling the people of God, the church, Christians, you know, whoever, you know, however you want to describe that, um, to get to get away, you know, just to, you know, a, a physical departure you know, or maybe not even a physical departure, but I mean a a disassociation with things having to do with with uh, with Babylon the Great. I mean, this would have been something. This would have been a message that would have been especially relevant to churches like the Church in Laodicea. Again, for discussions that we that we've had before, 
they had luxury and they were talking about, you know, you know, we're in need of nothing, um, which, you know, you're like, uh, you know, that's not an attitude that you really want to have, you know, that sort of thing. And so, you know, in like manner, we don't want any of God's people, whatever church and whatever, whatever country or whatever nation they, are, they exist in, or whatever, to hitch their wagon to Babylon the Great. And so as a matter of holiness, a lot of people might look at this and say, this is a call to God's people saying, separate and disassociate yourself from her because you are a, you are a different people. And also, you know, because you could, there, there are consequences in, you know, in this, you know, because you might get caught up in the snare of committing the same sins and that sort of thing. So I think that that's how a lot of people might look at this. Now, I'm going to go out a little bit. I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit here. Um, while I think that it's valid that the church should take warning, and again, the church like Laodicea is a good case in point, um, you know, how the church should take warning and not being drawn in to um, the lavishness and the luxurious uh, appeal of, of the woman when, uh, who is Babylon the Great, um, I think I I think maybe that what's being shown John here by this angel is a little bit different here. Okay, I think, and and I'll explain I'll explain myself here. But I think that really what what the angel is getting at here is this is a call to my people, and my people being people who are drawn out by salvation that's close to that very end there. In other words, this is a this is another call to repentance for those people who have been hitched to the prostitute. And this is a last call sort of thing for a salvation for people to repent to come out of her so that they don't experience the judgment that's that's there. Now, the reason why I say that um is again mainly um well, a couple of reasons. Let's let's go with the obvious one first, or what I think might be the most obvious. Um, is again going back to chapter fourteen. Now, remember, in verse eight, we have the we have the similar language there that we see that we see here in chapter eighteen. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Okay, she who who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. That's the fall of Babylon the great announced, which is which is given more detail later there in chapter in in verses 14 through 20 um, which I believe was our third vision of the end but even before there if you remember you know there was one last appeal before this before the description of this judgment from an angel um, that was that was flying overhead uh, and it says in verse six there if you go back up there in chapter 14 it says with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, who are the dwellers of the earth? What have, what have, who have they been consistently throughout this whole time? They've been unbelievers um, uh, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. So judgment is right at the door. So there's that final appeal, um, you know, as we, as we said before, um, because the hour of, of his judgment has come and worship him who, who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So there's that final appeal there. And uh, well, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't even call it an appeal. I, I you know, thinking about this, it, it kind of makes it sound like it's kind of more of a begging sort of thing. This is and that's really not what it is. This is actually an authoritative command. That's really what it is. Uh, any call of repentance is that an authoritative command for people to repent and worship God. Maybe that's what we'll, what we'll call it. We'll, we'll, we'll try not to call it an appeal. It's, it's a, an authoritative command. But it's given right there near the very end as kind of that last call so that people can repent. Now, one of the things that we have seen um, is that, you know, is, is this concept or this theme of people being drawn out from a particular number of Earth's inhabitants to become followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, you think about the great multitude um, in chapter seven, um, where it says, "After uh, in, in verse nine, where it says, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, 
uh, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, which is interesting that it's that that's the description of the great multitude, given the fact that, you know, when you go to chapter 13, when it's talking about the beast and his authority and everything like that, it says it says there in verse seven that authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. So there you have that, but you see it back in chapter seven that you have people from that same classification that are going to be worshiping God, right? And so I think that, you know, one thing that you can say there is that salvation will still be available to those people, right? Um, in chapter in chapter 14, remember when we looked at the 144,000, um, you know, it says, uh, it, it says there um, in, uh, back at chapter 14, um, in verse uh, 4, it says, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind, right? Redeemed from mankind. So with all mankind who are sinners and everything, these are, are redeemed from that number. And listen, as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And remember, the whole concept of first fruits is supposed to tell us that there's a future harvest that is going to take place. And I think that that speaks to further salvation uh, that happens um, with all of this, okay? So ultimately, I think that that's what you're dealing with there, um, you know, and comparing, you know, what I had there with chapter 7 and chapter 13, but even more specifically and even more to the point with the similarities that you see there with, with, uh, with chapter 14. Here in chapter 18, you have a declaration that Babylon is the Babylon the Great is going to fall. And just like in chapter 14, and by the way, after the whole thing where it says fallen, fallen, it's Babylon the Great, remember the, the description of what is in store for those people who receive the mark of the beast in the verses that follow that, which would seem to be all the more incentive for people to heed the word of that angel and repent and turn to Christ and, and worship God. There. Okay. So here in chapter 18, with the, with the declaration of the, of the fall of Babylon, the, of Babylon the Great, I think you're dealing, this, you're dealing with the same thing here as you were in chapter 14. So that we're saying, come out, uh, come, come out of her, my people. He's talking about my people in the sense of those who, would, who are going to find salvation there near the very end, or at least a, a call or a beckoning, an effectual call, so to speak, to those people to come out so that they can be God's people. This isn't saying that they've always been God's people all along, even when, when they were in their rebellious ways. But I think this is their, this is their way of saying like those people at the very end, um, in light of the judgment that is about to actually happen here, in that final authoritative command, you have the people who, who repent and they become God's people. And so this is the effectual call, calling them out of that. Okay. Now here's another clue that you have here with this. So it says, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, right? And lest you share in her plagues. Now th that part there, lest you share in her plagues is a big clue for me because all throughout the book of Revelation, all throughout the book of Revelation, the things having to do with plagues have been plagues that have been unleashed on unbelievers. And because believers have the seal of God written on their foreheads, as we've seen in Revelation, they are spared from the wrath of God. The wrath of God, the plagues that are that are unleashed and everything is not for the believer. Okay, so I don't think that this is something that is specifically or primarily saying to Christians who have been following Jesus Christ this whole time, hey, get away because, you know, if you don't, there's going to be, you're going to be pulled in and then you're going to share in her sins and then you're going to suffer the same plagues that she does. If we're, if we're following the, the consistent pattern in the book of Revelation, you see that the plagues are not for believers. You think about the, tr uh, the trumpet judgments, you know, in, in that whole discussion and even with the bull judgments, we just got done looking at in chapter 16. The plagues that are unleashed there, it's, it's clear in those texts that those are reserved for unbelievers. And so the same with, with Babylon the Great, how the plague, these plagues are reserved for her, you know, I think the idea is, is that if you don't repent and turn to the Lord, these are the same plagues that are going to befall you, um, you know, if you don't get out of there. So there's that call 
come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. And the sins are going to, you know, if not repented of, are going to lead to that last part there where it says, lest you share in her plagues. Okay. So there's that one final call that's out there. All right. Now listen, verse five, for her sins are heaped high as heaven. Okay. Uh, And God has remembered her iniquities. Okay. So this is, again, uh, you know, it is something that you that you see um, similar language from the Old Testament. If you read Ezra's prayer um, in Ezra chapter nine, Ezra uses similar language um, in light of Israel's sin and praying to God and saying how their sins have reached to the reached up to heaven. It's a way of saying that our sins are many; they're stacked up so high. I mean, it's supposed to give us this this unbelievable understanding of just how sinful. Uh, mankind is and how we are. And as it relates to people who engage with Babylon the Great, this is the same thing that you see that you see there. Um, you know, for her sins are heaped high as heaven. And listen, and God uh, and God has remembered her iniquities. And that's language pulled uh, pulled from places like Psalm 109 and Hosea 9, where there's that remembrance of 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 the sins, and those sins are and iniquities are therefore judged. Okay. Um, it's it kind of has it kind of has um, I, I I don't think this is a, this is the direct um, reference that's being made here, but as far as the concept goes, I think that conceptually, it's just kind of what you see in places like the Book of Romans, um, where it talks about you know man kind of storing up wrath against themselves for the day of judgment. Okay, they you know they they're storing up, they're stockpiling. So that, you know, when it comes to the day of judgment, if those sin, if there hasn't been repentance for the forgiveness of sins on the day of judgment, all those sins that they've racked up in their lifetime is going to be judged and it's going to be an eternal judgment. Okay. And God remembers those. Okay. So God, so God is, is one who, I mean, God knows every single iniquity that's committed by these people committed by Babel on the great. And all those people associated associated with her, and um, when you look at the ledger, you know you see that it's page upon page upon page upon page upon page upon page of page of iniquities. Now, if you're a believer, you don't have to worry about that because you're justified in Christ. There's nothing going to be. There's nothing on the ledger. In fact, you know the ledger in your book is going to be stamped paid in full because of Christ. And you're going and you have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you. So there isn't a storage of sins that are going to be judged because Christ paid it. But if we're talking about unrepentant sinners and unrepentant Babylon the Great here, you have sins that reach as high as heaven. And trust me, God remembers her iniquities. And that remembrance is supposed to call to mind this whole thing of because God remembers it. He's not going to overlook it and it will, and there will be judgment to follow. Now there's a call in verse six where it says, pay her back as she herself has paid back others and, and, and repay her double for her deeds, mix a double portion for, for her in the cup, of, in the cup she mixed. That's verse six. So, you know, this is a call saying like, you know, this is, you know, as you've done on this earth, you know, so, you know, this should be done to you again. This is a, this is again, something that you see in the old Testament. You can you know, specifically, you can look at places like Psalm 137 verse eight, you know, that sort of thing. And so with the sins there that are, that are committed here, there's repayment for all of those one for one sort of thing, a paid back, a paid back just as you've done on this earth. So you're going to be paid back here and it's going to be an eternal judgment. And the whole thing of, you know, uh, and repay her double her deeds and mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. Um, from my understanding, the best way to understand that is that double or twice is actually what it what it's meaning to convey in that is duplicate. Which again, that's 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 kind of the the sense that you get in the words before that point, and even in the first part of verse seven where it says, "And she glorified herself." Um, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Okay. So here's the, so here's the call to, you know, you know, for Babylon, for Babylon, the great calling down on judgment on her. 
um, you know, because of all. And again, we don't have to go into detail into all of this because we've looked at it before in past passages and in past episodes, uh, more specifically in, in chapter 17. Um, but, you know, as she's done and, you know, notice the language that that's used there, you know, um, uh, you know, um, uh, and repay her double uh, for her deeds, mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. Because, again, it's talking about the 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 cup or the goblet that she um, that she's had that she's held in her hand um, in chapter 17, verse four, the uh, last part of verse four. Uh, near the end of verse four, it says, um, it says in her hand, a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Um, and so, yeah, this, you know, again, um, so you get, you get the idea there. So it's a call to judgment against her. And again, you saw that again in the, in the, in the first part of verse seven, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury. Now notice that she has, as she glorified herself, this is somebody, a perfect example of Romans chapter of Romans chapter one, somebody who refused to give God glory and to give thanks to him. Okay. Why? What's she busy doing? She's busy glorifying herself, which is just as idolatrous as anything else that you see in scripture. Even the idolatry that's explained in Romans chapter one, um, because even if it's a glorification of yourself, you know, you've made yourself an idol that counts. Um, so it says, you know, as she has glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. So yeah, this is something that's going to be given her in judgment, you know, as it relates, you know, torment and mourning and everything like that. So, and listen to what the rest of verse seven says. It says, since in her heart, so this is, there's a reason behind this, this whole thing is called a judgment. Since in her heart, she says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow and mourning. I shall never see. Wow. What, what pride and arrogance we have here. Now, this is something that this is, this is an internal spiritual reality that, that, that describes Babylon the great, because it says in her heart, she says this. This isn't something where she's necessarily declaring this out loud. This is something that's internal in her heart, you know, where she says, I, you know, I sit as a queen, you know, and, and so forth and so on. This whole thing of, you know, I will not be a widow. You know, you see, uh, you see this sort of language in Isaiah chapter 47. Um, and let me read this to you. I want to read this to you. Um, Isaiah, um, these two verses in Isaiah 47. Um, in Isaiah, um, Isaiah 47, um, let's see here. Um, Isaiah chapter 47 and verses seven and eight, I believe, um, where it says you, uh, you said, you said, I shall be mistress forever so that, and the, again, this is, again, this is words about Babylon in ancient Babylon, in, in ancient history, um, you said, I shall be, I shall be mistress forever so that you did, so that you did not lay these things to heart or remember their end. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am sick, I am, and there is no one besides me. I shall, I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. And then it goes on further into what, what God declares um, against Babylon. But did you notice there? It says, who says in your heart, again, just as we saw in Revelation 18, but here in Isaiah it says, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. What is that? That is a declaration on the, on the part of Babylon in, in this passage in Isaiah of declaring, its, uh, declaring itself as God. Okay. As God, which to me sounds, you know, sounds very much like the beast, even though we're not talking specifically about the beast and the beast turns on her. But remember, this was, you know, the beast, she rode the beast. So they were kind of one in spirit as far as it related to that before the beast turned on her. Uh, but here in, 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 in chapter 47, it says, I am, and there is no one besides me. Those are words that are specifically used to describe Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And then it said, and then she, and then Babylon says, I shall, I shall not, I shall not sit as a widow 
or know the loss of children. What arrogance, right? What arrogance. And so, you know, uh, you know, when you're looking at this, you know, should, you know, in chapter, in chapter 18, again, the middle of verse seven, it's, it's, she's saying in her heart, I sit as a queen. So she's saying, I rule. I'm, I'm the one who's in charge. Now, again, we've seen in different places who is really in charge behind this whole thing. It's God himself. Even, even what we saw last time, we saw that God is the one who is calling all the shots. He's sovereign and he's using other nations to, to carry out his own particular purposes. Sounds like to me that he's in charge. Sounds very much to me like he's the one who's ruling and he's in charge and he's the one calling the shots. But Babylon the Great, this woman, she's the one who sent, who's saying, I sit as queen. And not only that, she says, just as it was said in Isaiah 47, I am no widow and mourning I shall never see. Okay. Now you think of mourning in the Bible and you think of mourning in the first century context, or even if you go back into Old Testament times, Usually you think widow, you think devastation, you think uh, destitution, um, uh, poverty, and that sort of thing, because you didn't have, again, listen, you didn't have life insurance back then. You lost your husband and your sons. Um, then you had no livelihood to speak of, and you became poor pretty quickly, and you became dependent on so many other people, right? Um, and so this whole thing of, you know, you know, it, just imagine in a, in a devastating war, if a woman lost her husband and or her sons, um, you know, she, and she's seen as a widow, there's no one to provide for her. Um, and so there's no destitution. Uh, you know, I mean, there is destitution, excuse me, to speak of if, if a widow, if you're talking about a widow who has no husband and no, and at least no grown sons to kind of pick up the slack on that. Um, you're, you're a widow, you're in, you're in deep, deep trouble as far as, you know, economically and financially and that sort of thing. Now just think of who we've been dealing with, with Babylon the Great and this, and this, and this prostitute who's dressed in luxury. She's saying my luxury and everything that I have about me and, 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 and everything like that is going to last forever. Economic prosperity, never going to end. It's going to be, it, it, you know, this is how it's going to be forever. So when she says, I am no widow, um, and, uh, and mourning, I shall never see, she's saying, you know, this is the way it's going to be forever luxury and everything like that. All of that is going to be eternal. And isn't that the way a lot of people, a, a lot of people exist today, especially in, in very, in very rich environments in very rich countries. Um, a lot of people will put their hope in their, in their money and their wealth and their bank accounts and that sort of thing. Listen, when it comes to the end, or even when you die, whichever comes first, you don't even have to wait till the end. If you die before that time, your wealth and your riches aren't going to do anything for you. And even while, while people are alive, you know, riches don't protect you from anything having to, you know, as far as it relates to economic devastation and that sort of thing has, it gives you zero protection. You know, we're talking about here in Revelation 18, how things are going to look in the end. Listen, that is going to be true at the end, but even, even in our lifetime between, you know, in all throughout history, this has been true. Why do you think it's been the case for some people who have been rich and wealthy and given whatever circumstance that happens, they end up losing everything, you know, with, with a serious economic downturn, um, irresponsible financial handling, or maybe a combination of both, whatever the case may be, they lose everything and they end up, they end up killing themselves. Why? Because they put all their hope in what they have, in their wealth, in their money, in their bank accounts. And you can't do that. Their attitude before that time, maybe, you know, maybe not said explicitly, but maybe in the same heart attitude as, the, as Babylon the Great, saying, this is going to be mine forever. There's no way that I can lose this. If you have $10 million and you have a lot of that in the bank, I mean, you put that in, in several bank accounts, you can live off the interest alone. Um, and you look at that and they're saying, there's no way that any sort of economic devastation can come upon me. Listen, there have been people who have had seemingly from their own eyes, everything, and then they lost it all. And because that was their only hope and listen, you're, you're not going to get that back with a snap of a finger. So you're, you're, I mean, you're never, you're never going to see those days again. And, and if that's where, the, that's where your hope lies, 
you know, a lot of people, they, they lose hope and they, and they go into mourning and lamenting um, and they end up taking their own lives. Unfortunately, some of them do, um, you know, when they put their hope in that. But, you know, that's the, that's the attitude. That is an attitude of Babylon the Great. So if people go into her and they have that attitude, it, it's, it's no wonder because that's the attitude of Babylon the Great, the, par, the prostitute there. And, you know, just says, I'm, you know, I am no widow and mourning I shall never see. Um, and so in verse eight, what you have, it says, for this reason, her plagues will come in, will come in a single day. And if I remember correctly in that Isaiah 47 passage, we didn't read that, but I mean, like in the, if you read further, I think um, it, it, give, it uses language of, of short term language where devastation is going to come on them quickly in a short, in a short period of time. Um, and, and listen, that's the theme that you're going to see in the rest of chapter 18 here in revelation, um, how, how her devastation and her destruction is just so swift and it's just seemingly just comes out of nowhere. And that's kind of what's going to happen with Babylon the great. It says, for this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine. You know, you don't expect to be touched by famine or anything like that when you're rich and you have everything and that sort of thing. The the woman's haughty heart attitude, um, what's, what's going to happen to her in reality is going to be the exact inverse of everything that she thought in her heart. Now you see, now do you see, you know, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're talking about that and then connecting that to judgment that will follow for everybody who goes into her. Do you see why there's a call for people in verse four, come out of her, my people, so that you don't share in her sins and that you don't share in her plagues that's that's about to befall her. Death and mourning and famine is going to be her lot. And then the last part there, verse eight, it says, and she will be burned up with fire. And we saw that in in chapter, in at the end of chapter 17, we looked at that last time, remember? Um, and she will be burned up with fire for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Now I, that, that is a, that is a, I, I, I don't know what, what word to use, but I mean, that is, I mean, you want to talk about again, who shows himself to be in charge and the description of that. There you have it right there. But by the way, the whole thing of she will be burned with fire in Isaiah chapter 14, if you were to look in verse, uh, in, excuse me, chapter 47, if you were to look at verse 14, it talks about the whole thing of being burned with fire and that sort of thing. Um, so there, you know, again, in that whole chapter there, it talks about the destruction of Babylon, even though Babylon was using that haughty language that even we see here in chapter 18 of Revelation. Um, but it says, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. The woman has set herself up and thought that she was one who was mighty and that she would be one who would last forever and that she would not see any mourning and that she would not be a widow or anything like that. That was her haughty language. And then when the when Babylon the Great gets what's, what, what comes to her, what's coming to her, that shows who actually is mighty. It's not the woman. It's not Babylon the Great. It's our Lord God Almighty. It says, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And remember, again, keep in mind what we saw in the Isaiah passage. Remember, before the whole thing of, you know, where, it's, where it said, where Babylon says, I shall not sit as a widow. Remember, remember what it said there in that passage? I am and there is no one besides me. That's Babylon talking. That's Babylon's self-proclamation, this self-declaration of itself. Now, this Babylon the Great here in chapter 18, who kind of has the same spirit and the same attitude as has been displayed in of the ancient Babylon that we read about in the Old Testament. When judgment comes, we see, we come to see who truly is mighty and who truly is God. Okay. It's not Babylon the Great. It's not the prostitute. It's not the, it's not the woman. God Almighty himself shows himself to be God and in charge and in authority and the swiftness of her, of her, of her, of her judgment is going to be devastating. And like I said before, it's going to affect everybody else who went, who went into her and engaged it and engaged with her. And that's what we're going to look at 
um, you know, for much of the of the chapter starting next time. Um, and we're going to see how this devastates people of the earth. And again, the big clincher in this is how is how swift this judgment has come about. This wasn't something that started with a progressive thing and then until it reaches final end. It was just kind of boom, like that. And so the luxury and the riches of everybody else who engage with the woman, they are deeply affected by this as well. And they lament and they mourn. And we're going to look at these lamentations in the morning and everything next time. So I hope you understand. I hope this gives you a picture of who God is. Number one, how he's mighty, how he's just, but also how he's merciful, where he's calling to his people. And again, I think that those are, I guess you can call them last minute people near the end, who he's going to call and people who are going to find salvation before that final judgment comes. And he's saying, look, he's, he's wanting people to be saved from that judgment from from that torment and from the plagues and everything like that you know we see a glimpse again of god of god's mercy in that and listen we've seen that before in revelation remember the people who were in torment during the trumpet judgments and it says that they couldn't that they tried to find death and they couldn't find it remember that's not god preventing them from finding death so that they can experience more of his torment as if if, as if they if they found death, that would be an easy way out. That death isn't a way out. That's just that's just entering into torment of a greater kind and of an eternal kind. So if God is preventing them from finding death in the midst of the of the of the trumpet plagues, that tells me that what God is trying to do is trying to get them to repent so they don't fall over that cliff into that final torment that's eternal. That's the kind of God that we serve. Now listen. The sad reality is, is that there are going to be many, many people who do not heed the call. And we, and we see that in, in, we've seen that in many different visions up to this point in Revelation, and we're going to continue to see that in passages to follow. Okay. But our God is a saving God and he's a just God. He's a mighty God. He's a God of judgment and wrath. All of those things, we're seeing all of these characteristics characteristics of God, characteristics that shouldn't surprise us, but they're, they're a great reminder to us nonetheless. But it does show us, you know, both the grace and mercy of God as well as, as his judgment and his wrath. Both of those things are true of our God. We can't look at one and then ignore the other, okay? But anyway, have that in your heart and your mind, and we'll pick up on, on, on the rest of chapter 18 next time. But for now, we're going to leave it there. Okay. If you enjoy the show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio, YouTube, or Spotify. You can also follow me, Steve Gill, on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L-T-S-C-R-I-P-T-S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. And also don't forget to order a copy of my book, Signs of the End, What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return and the Events That Point to It, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Um, I will leave the Amazon link anyway. You, I mean, you can get it to BarnesandNoble.com or anywhere else. Um, but I will leave the link to the Amazon page in the episode description. You can just go there and click there and place a place an order for the book if you so choose. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I had a great time examining scripture as I always do. My name is Steve Gill, and I will see you right back here next time. Bye now. <laughs>